Good morning. This is Bill from out of Europa, Naples on a, you know, somewhat balmy Florida Wednesday. We're in the middle of our unusually hot week, uh, which is just completely unacceptable in terms of the weather we've been waiting for. Uh, you know, again, we suffer through the summer months. I can also feel them beckoning. It's already mid-January. July is not that far away. And we're in, you know, line for swampy mosquito weather. So th these little reprieves of the winter months when the weather is fantastic fantastic down here are a very welcome change and to get a week of 85 degree weather is just on a, now you know I know it's negative 30 in Cleveland or what actually I, I hear it's balmy up north too but you know nobody wants to hear anyone complaining about 85 degree weather when it's pretty damn cold outside up north but I can tell you that uh, summer is so friggin miserable here that we need this thank god there's a light at the end of the tunnel next week it's supposed to be in the 70s we even have a low in the 40s for a couple of days thank god uh, it's the only way i'm going to hang on to my sanity uh, birds quiet nothing up there fantastic lovely I haven't heard the roosters in a while hopefully they got shot run over or otherwise disposed of but um, you know probably they'll pop out when i least expect it uh, the way these things do uh, and today I have this 2001 Mercedes-Benz SLK 230 Roadster. This is the R170 chassis. It came out, I want to say it was in Europe in 96. And it was an instant sensation. There was like a two-year waiting list for this thing. Uh, dealers were raping people, charging premiums. When it came to the United States in 98, it just extended the waiting list. And uh, people went absolutely nuts for them. And uh, it was a pretty important car for Mercedes-Benz in the sense that it brought a little bit of youth into the company. Uh, they'd come under some sort of, I don't know, people were kind of annoyed with Mercedes. They were stodgy. The average Mercedes driver was either, you know, 90 or 100 years old, maybe even deceased and reanimated. Uh, they just weren't cars for youthful people. And Mercedes took some efforts to change that in the 1990s. The E-Class got a little bit lighter, the C. You know, they they yeah they dicked around with their lineup and made it a little bit more uh, youthful. And the SLK, in many ways, was the center point of that effort. Uh, all of a sudden, Mercedes-Benz is building a very small two-seat roadster uh, inspired by <coughs> a couple of cars over there, you might see. Uh, and, uh, you know, even though it didn't you know compete directly with the Miata in terms of uh, market segment. It very much went up hard against the Boxster, the TT, and uh, what the hell was the other one? Of course, the BMW Z3. And it did it in its own way. And uh, even though Mercedes never really got caught up in that retro fad, they did seep a couple of little retro bits into this car, hoping you might not notice. Uh, you see the two power bumps, they call them in the hood. Sorry about the mist. What are you going to do? Hot weather. But we got a bump here and we got a bump over here. Uh, that is uh, somewhat reminiscent of the old 300 SL uh, gull wing that uh, you might uh, have seen in an Andy Warhol painting. Uh, uh, they also added, uh, you know, I'll show you some of this stuff. The interior is kind of retro with the hump there with the chrome surrounds, very 50s, 300 SL-ish. And uh, you see these little rubber inserts in this door sill. Uh, that was meant to look a little bit like the uh, lightweight running boards on the uh, very uh, early 1920s SSK uh, Roadster. There's our detailer. You know, his Volvo is running sour, so... Uh, through the kindness of our hearts, we're letting him drive stuff that's just coming in to test it. And you can just tell he's enjoying it too much. Uh, yeah, you know, if he just wiped that smile off his face a little bit more, then uh, it wouldn't be so irritating. But anyway, uh, the SLK came out to huge fanfare, mostly because of the power folding hardtop known as the Vario roof. And that was a joint effort between Mercedes and Porsche. But we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, this is an 01. So it's the redesign, the refresh, if you will. It's still the exact same one that came out in 98, but, you know, they stiffened the frame, made it a little bit more crash-worthy. They taut, uh, tightened up the bumpers. They made it a little more stubby and substantial 
at the back. They change the wheels, the mirrors, the rocker panels, uh, the little stuff Mercedes does and what they call a facelift car to refresh it and help sales grow. Uh, but that was never really a problem with the SLK. It was always selling pretty damn well. Uh, this thing though, Arctic White, 37,000 miles, immaculate mint. Uh, these are aspiring collectibles. You'll hear people say that and uh, they're uh, going up in value, which is a nice thing. And if you're gonna get one to collect and go up in value, uh, one like this is probably a pretty good place to start. So many of these things were ridden hard and put away wet, went through seven owners and got beat to crap. Uh, this thing has led a very soft life and it shows. And the nice thing in reviewing this one is it gives us much more of a chance to feel uh, what, to, uh, what the car was like when it was new. So uh, anyway, the design is quite nice. It's, you know, mercedes ass. Uh, it's uh, again designed to compete with little roadsters like the Miatas, but more so the Boxster and the uh, TT and such. And it was small, even smaller than a Z3, uh, even though in typical Mercedes fashion it weighed more. But uh, you know, very, very short wheelbase. Uh, they used a C class platform, they shortened it, they stiffened it, uh, they did all kinds of stuff to make it better. Uh, they use a double wishbone independent up front with Mercedes, very yeah, you know, tried and true multi-link suspension in the back. And the car does handle quite well and has a tremendous structural rigidity, which is very nice in a small convertible. And, uh, you know, they thought they were going to sell the bulk of these things to women, probably <laughs> like the Miata or hairdressers or whatnot, but it didn't wind up that way. In fact, more men bought them, uh, you know, boomers and, uh, you know, middle-aged guys who wanted something fun to throw around. Maybe they wanted an SL, but didn't want to have the SL upkeep, uh, upkeep and expense. Uh, SLK, in fact, stands for uh, basically sport light curs or compact. You'll see here some people say the K is for compressor. It's not. Uh, compressor is just a side of it. You could get these things without the compressor, the supercharger, so it would be dumb to have that in the name. Uh, curs means uh, small. Like when you see a 9mm curs, uh, that's like a 380. It's a, it's a small uh, bullet that goes into the gun and doesn't quite have the, the pact of the full 9mm. And uh, that could be said uh, to be true of this SLK. Anyway, we're going to fight through the mist and get into this thing. Let's start inside the trunk. So you actually get more space in the trunk uh, than you do in a Miata with the uh, you know top up or down. Uh, five cubic feet, not bad. Not great, but not bad. You know, they were trying to sell these things as some people's only means of transportation, so uh, it did have to have some storage space. Now when the top is down, you only do get this little slit here, like the crap that medieval people used to fire arrows through, so you have to reach in there and get it. Uh, but there is some room in there, which is quite nice and you can see the way that this lovely uh, folding hardtop fits into place. Uh, now when this car was new it was about 40 grand which isn't cheap mind you but uh, is definitely cheaper than your average Mercedes so uh, they went to great lengths to keep this car affordable. Uh, if they'd made it too expensive they would have stopped people from buying it. There would have been better choices for the money. Anyway let's have a look under the hood. Okay, so there is a 2.3 liter inline four cylinder with an Eaton type supercharger. Uh, essentially, the motor from the C Class sends the, uh, the supercharger. You didn't get that in that. Uh, and this one is, uh, yeah, man, if you look at these things, what's out there, this thing's incredibly mint. Uh, these things tend to get aluminum corrosion and, you know, they don't leak or anything, but the paint flecks off them. Same with the red cover uh, there for the uh, spark plugs and coils and such. Uh, to see one like this is really nice. Brings me back to when these cars were new and uh, absolutely mint under there. But, you know, not bad. 191 horsepower, I believe. Pretty good torque rating. You know, V6 power out of that inline four. That's something you see a lot today, but back then, eh, wasn't always the case. Now, you could also get a V6 in these things, which was quite nice, but at a certain point, it starts to belie the point. I mean, when you've got this big, heavy two-seat roadster, well, you might as well go to the SL. So, uh, I think these cars more correctly have uh, the four cylinder, I think that's the true proper engine for them. And I think the six just came out to make some people who were crying about horsepower and smoothness better, uh, you know, satisfied. Now, I will say this it doesn't have a very high red line.
design, which is shocking, because you get a twin cam 16 valve uh, four cylinder. You think the thing should be able to rev to, you know, the mid sevens or, you know, at least 6,500, but it's got a red line under six, about 5,800. Uh, I think that's a little bit annoying in a Roadster. Uh, you could get a five or six speed manual gearbox in them, but frankly, Mercedes sucks at building manual gearboxes the way BMW does at building V8. So uh, the five speed in this car, the automatic, is a much better choice. It's even faster from zero to 60, uh, unusual for a uh, manual versus auto, and uh, does turn in the same or better gas mileage. So so, uh, you know, again, I don't think most people bought these things the way they bought Miatas to fling them around racetracks or autocross courses, and uh, I think the automatic's just fine. Anyway, everything very nice and clean under there, very proper and lovely, very collectible quality, so uh, if you get this one, you're going to be pretty happy with it. I think the one big prop rod, you know, hood strut, I guess they figured that's all you needed, but goddamn, that's a big sucker. All right, let's have a look inside. Uh, in here, you know, they did a few things to make these cars lightweight. I think they would have liked to make them out of aluminum, but that would have been cost prohibitive. So the car is made out of steel. Uh, so they had to cut weight wherever they could. And they did use expensive little magnesium uh, roll bars underneath that plastic. So uh, they also drilled the brake pedal and other little ways to, to keep the car light. Uh, ways they didn't bother to keep the car light were by putting things like power seats in it and, you know, big bulky or <laughs> panels with airbags and this is so typically Mercedes I mean you get into that Miata either uh, that NA or the NB which was uh, you know again right exactly at the time this car was being made and everything is so light in it and flimsy it, it's quality enough but it's light Mercedes took really uh, you know, maybe they drilled the damn brake pedal, but for the love of God, I mean, there's so much. It's like you took a Miata and an Eldorado and you mated them, and this would be the, uh, uh, this would be their love child. Anyway, let's hop in. Now, they did make this thing, again, more youthful, and they did that by doing these sort of two-tone things. Uh, you see it does have a door airbag there. Uh, they've got this sort of weird carbon fibery look, uh, whatnot. Ah, uh, there's Marty going in. Morning, Marty. Good morning. Looking unusually normal this morning. And uh, anyway, they uh, you know they made him look a little bit more youthful. I think people were again annoyed at how stodgy Mercedes was, and this answered that. You get these cool little map pockety, flappy things there. You got the um, uh, the answer. That's just fire it up. And I got a couple of keys for this, which is nice. All right, so there it is. That was one of the things people complained about is they didn't like the exhaust note uh, from this uh, four-cylinder. It wasn't as lovely as it would be in like the uh, the Miata, but yeah, what are you gonna do? Let's get our defrost on. Hopefully it's not too loud. So again, you see more of that fish scaly aluminum thing. Uh, I think that's quite nice. It sort of harkens back to the racing cars of the 20s and 30s in, uh, in a nice retro fashion. Uh, also the white face gauges with the uh, chrome surrounds. They're good, they're nice, they give you what you need. Uh, you've got your uh, water temp, your fuel. Look at this, a full tank. It's like the rarest thing in the world for a car to come in with a full tank. It's bizarre. Everyone's going to want this. Uh, you get a little, I mean, around here, everything you get in has the gas light glowing. And it's like a race to make sure you can make it to the gas station without, or make it, you know, oh my God, I've got to go to the tag office. Hopefully I can do it while not running out of gas. And then maybe Bill will run out of gas when he drives the thing around. So uh, that's just the way it goes. Uh, anyway, you see you've got, uh, uh, what do you have? Your water temp, your fuel, your uh, 160 mile an hour speedo your uh, tack over there, all the uh, indicators, the digital stuff in there is quite nice. What do we have? Do we have our defrost going here? Let's see. I don't, I don't exactly know how to run it on defrost. It's kind of annoying. I'll turn that down a little bit. It's just too loud. Uh, anyway, all the digital stuff there is good. You see you have your exterior temperature, your trip, uh, your uh, odometer, 37,000 miles, shockingly nice. Uh, you got a digital clock, you got your PRNDL 
transmission indicator, you got your dimmer and your trip reset, you got your cruise control where you'd expect it, your wipers down here. This is a telescoping steering wheel, goes in and out but not up and down. I kind of like the, uh, the two-tone design of it, you know, again, sort of racy or whatnot, kind of cool. Of course, you got airbags everywhere. You got cup holders to put your Perrier, lovely. And they actually work, but I feel like they're gonna break soon. This is just a typical Mercedes-Benz over-engineered cup holder. And I think the bolts to attach it are somewhere under the hood. So you have to take half the car apart to replace it, lovely. Uh, you got your vents here. You've got your climate control that's quite simple. Uh, you've got your uh, Mercedes-Benz sort of in-dash cassette. I think there's a CD player in the back, let's say. No changers, you're stuck with the cassette. Let's see what we have on the radio. I have absolutely nothing. Always with the... Oh, here we go. Eh, Wayne, take them or leave them. You gotta be in the right mood. Uh, underneath here, if I go to tape, let's see, and hit eject, it's gonna pop open that guy. And uh, this is useful because, you know, even though the car is too old to have like auxiliary inputs or Bluetooth, you can get one of those cassette adapters, uh, stick it in there, close this guy, uh, run your phone through it, and uh, then you don't have to change the factory radio, which is mint in this car, by the way, uh, to something annoying uh, that's going to look terrible and out of place. Uh, you've got your ESP, electronic stability program, that's the traction control in this car. You know, you can turn it off and think you're going to be going, doing donuts and flipping yourself into switchbacks at the racetrack, but you're really not. It's just not that kind of car. Uh, you've got your hazard there, your lock and unlock. This shuts off the motion sensor if you're getting towed. Uh, this isn't working, probably. They never are. I'm not even going to dick with it. But you have an ashtray down there if you're a smoker. Um, whether it works or not, yeah, we'll see. Uh, you got a nice little shifter, two-tone leather, lovely. Uh, with the gate, you know, Mercedes-style chrome around the fish scale, which is weird, but it works. Uh, winter and summer setting. Uh, it's going to leave it second gear most of the time unless you hammer it and uh, then it'll flip down into first and you know That's one of my complaints about the car. I'd like it to leave in first every time uh, Without having to either mash the throttle or uh, you know put this thing in summer, which I don't think does it every time anyway uh, You know it just leaves too light and or too heavy. There's just nothing in between uh, but again, I don't think the purpose of this car was uh, exactly uh, racing or sportiness uh, beyond uh, appearances. You've got your power windows. Uh, this was one of the first cars or first Mercedes that had this sort of detector. So uh, when the car is running, if you don't have somebody heavy in here, a proper American, uh, it's going to have the uh, airbag turned off because it's just going to assume a kid's in there. He wants it's like 70 pounds. So I don't know if Karen Carpenter is going to set off the airbag, but she might. Uh, but anyway, so when you're sitting in there, it has automatic switching for the uh, airbag. Uh, here is your power mirrors. This thing runs your top. You've got this tiny little knotted ashtray that is over there. So you've got your lighter there and a little... You're, you're not going to fit any... I mean, maybe a switch plate. Maybe... What, what are those tiny little guns? I, I forget already. The um, LLQ9 or something. Anyway, whatever. Little tiny thing might fit in there. But otherwise, forget it. This is not a car for weapons. I guess you could fit a much bigger one in here, which is fine. Uh, you probably get your uh, standard size 9mm, but it's a little bit far back. It's going to take you a while to grab it uh, if there's trouble. Uh, let's run the top. So to do that, I'm going to press forward on this guy. See, it turns red. Now, the trunk is going to come up from the front. The Vario roof is going to start moving forward. Very, very nice. And again, co-designed by Porsche. You want reliability, you got Porsche and Mercedes together. Uh, seals very nicely into place, and down goes the trunk. Uh, now that's running about five hydraulic cylinders, which, yeah, occasionally they do need replacement, just like in an ESL. But SLK tops seem to have been more dependable for me than just about any other kind. God bless them. Uh, you keep your finger on it until all the windows go up and you're set. Now, let me show you the way the car looks. 
So very, very nice. And again, if you go back to 1998 when this thing came out in the States, that top would draw a crowd. People went absolutely nuts for it. Uh, it wasn't the first folding hard top, but it was very, very early and uh, people loved it. You know, you'd have to demonstrate it like three, four times every time you went out to dinner. And uh, yeah, and now they're all over the place. It's not the same thing, but still pretty cool when Mercedes was there bright and early. All right, let's go for a spin. I think I'll leave the top up just for the noise. Although noise is actually not bad in this car. Again, the aerodynamics and such have all been designed uh, to make it uh, less hard on the senses. So I'm getting a little bit of AC going. It's that friggin' hot already. Turn the radio down and away we go. So the, here's the problem with the SLK. I can't really fault it in terms of handling. I think it's like 89 on the skid pad, 0.89, which is great. Uh, it's very rigid as a sports car should be. You don't get a lot of body flex. You don't get creaks and groans the way you might in an old Corvette. Um, the power is there, you know, almost 200 horsepower in a very small car. Uh, even in typical Mercedes fashion, it weighs about 3,000 pounds, but still, power's there, way more than a Miata. Steering, eh, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's not exactly lively. It doesn't give you the same joy that you get out of a Mazda, but I'm not, I'm not sure that's really the point with this car. And I'm not sure that's why Mercedes built it. See the flashing triangle, there's our traction control, the German nanny coming in too. Although, you know, in an owner survey, most people said the handling was one of the things they loved the best about this car. So, uh, it does handle. I mean, you can flip it through traffic, you can run it into corners, and it drives really, really nice but it just doesn't give me the same connection to the road that I get in a Boxster or in a, um, uh, in a Miata. But maybe the traditional buyer of this car is not into that. Uh, also the exhaust note, not in love with it. Actually a little bit loud even when you're hammering it and uh, doesn't really have a nice sweetness to it the way uh, a Boxster or Miata does, but yeah, it's fine. At higher revs, you can hear the supercharged whine a little bit, which is cool. And uh, I have absolutely zero complaints about the braking or the straight line performance. The car is quick, quick enough, quick enough. And it is nice to dart around, I have to say. I mean, don't even consider it's anything like the SL. Much, much lighter than that. Feels more nimble and uh, more fun to throw around the way that a little roadster should. But I think the main purpose of this car uh, was style and being seen in it and having fun in it. I'm not sure the main purpose was driving joy. Uh, now, I mean, you get enough of that, certainly more than you get in your traditional Camry or E-Class. So, you know, put the top down, you're gonna have the time of your life, especially if you're not somebody who's vying for the Formula One championship. But, um, uh, but uh, I don't think Mercedes had in mind pure driving joy. I think they wanted to build a nice, high quality roadster to compete with Porsche, uh, Audi, and uh, BMW, uh, while still retaining the qualities that make a Mercedes Mercedes. Uh, that being, you know, heavy, quality built, uh, you know, long lived, uh, fun for people with a little bit of extra money. So, uh, we we'll call it a rich man's Miata, call it what you will. Uh, this is the R170 SLK. It was the uh, first of the SLK series. Uh, this one, 37,000 miles, mint, lovely, collectible quality. Uh, absolutely fantastic stuff. And we got the meds coming through. Naples, you see that all the time. The average age here is deceased. Anyway, um, God, that's loud. Um, so there it is. If you have an interest in this thing, you can check it out at aenaples.com. Give Marty a call, 239-298-8000. Uh, if you want to put one away in the garage or want the nicest one for weekend fun, this is a good choice. Uh, otherwise, we'll pick something fun to review later. Uh, really appreciate you having a look, and we will see you with the next one. Take care.